Your word, God, gives us the ability to do the things that we could not do in the natural but God, through your spirit and the, and the spirit of your word, we are able to transcend the darkness and to move through those situations that are impossible in the natural and see victory after victory. So we thank you today, this evening, as we come together to hear you and to understand you in newer dimensions. We give you the praise, sir. B'Shem Yehoshua HaMashiach, in the name of Jesus, the Messiah, we pray. Amen and amen. Hallelujah. You may be seated. Praise God. It's a delight to be here. I want to talk to you about prayer and the presence of God. Praise God. And I want to take us, first of all, to the book of Luke chapter 2. In Luke chapter 2, this portion of scripture, chapters 1 through 3, or chapters 1 and 2 especially, are usually read around the time of December, uh, between, well, after uh, a Feast of Tabernacles and the, uh, and the time period that uh, is celebrated in the Western world as Christmas, which both are the celebration of the birth of, um, uh, of, of Jesus, Yahushua. Uh, one is a secular celebration, the other is a biblical, but uh, we usually celebrate, bro- celebrate both as Christians. Um, uh, most Christians do, they celebrate the biblical one, which is uh, Feast of Tabernacles, and then they celebrate the secular one, which is Christmas. Um, uh, that we know that the Catholic Church brought it together and called it a Christ Mass, um, and so on like that. But chapters 1 and 2 are usually read about This is about the birth of Jesus during that time period. Most often you don't hear a lot of people reading it aloud, especially in a service or something. It's usually when the family gathers around, you know, and they're celebrating and they have all the lights and the trimmings and everything and sometimes some eggnog or something like that. And they read the, they call it the Christmas story. But it's the biblical story about the birth of Jesus Christ and then after his, after his birth and he grew, then we're getting into, we're in chapter 2 here now where we're, we're talked about that part. That part is read uh, about his birth and so forth. Now, in the latter part of chapter 2, we're going to start in chapter 2 around verse 40. And this is the time when Jesus grew. He began to grow. And now they are celebrating... Um, a time period called Pesach in Hebrew, Pascha in the Greek, in English is Passover. That is the biblical celebration of the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus. The secular celebration, which is an amalgamation of things, is called Easter. But Easter, remember, is a pagan goddess, Easter. But it's the time the church usually celebrates because the church is not really taught much about Pascha in the Greek, Pesach in Hebrew, Passover. So we get one little part of it called the resurrection, and we'll say he is risen, and then the response is he's risen indeed, usually Lutheran, so forth like that, and the rest of the body of Christ gets that. Uh, these are the kinds of things that, got, that people wanted to stone Jesus over when he talked to the religious people, didn't bother the secular folks, but when he messed with the pet peeves of the religious people, they wanted to kill him. And so it silences the leadership in the body of Christ. They are afraid to talk about these things because the religious folks get mad. They really do. And so, and so Jesus is now growing. And let's begin here at verse 40. Remember, we're talking about prayer and the presence of Jesus, the presence of God. It says, and the child grew and waxed strong in spirit, filled with wisdom, and the grace of God was upon him. Now his parents went to Jerusalem every year at the Feast of Passover. That's the English Feast of Passover. In the Hebrew, this word is Pesach. In Greek, it's Pascha. Now that's what the pagans call Easter. And the church embraced it. Okay. 
So I'm just telling you the truth, <laughs> whether you like it or not. It's the truth. <laughs> we, we don't get to pick what is truth. God put it there, and it's our choice what we do with it. It says, notice this, it says, now his parents went to Jerusalem every year at the feast of the Passover. And when he was 12 years old, they went up to Jerusalem after the custom of the feast. Now they had gone year after year after year. It was their custom. Every year they traveled from Nazareth, Galilee to Jerusalem, to Jerusalem, uh, uh, Judea, to celebrate Pesach, Pascha. Now, let me give you the, the part. When I said that, I, I share some things with you, and I just wanted to let me give you uh, another scripture on what I'm saying before I, I, I talk more about um, prayer and the presence. As one who teaches the word, you know, I'd like to give the, the full background on things and, and not just throw out a few words for people to hear. Uh, I want them to see things in the scripture. Let's go to Acts chapter 12. Acts chapter 12 in verse 4. I've mentioned this before to us um, in Acts chapter 12. Uh, come on. Verse 4. Okay, there you go. <laughs> it says, let me get at verse 1. Now about that time, Herod the king stretched forth his hands to vex certain of the church. And he killed James, the brother of John, with the sword, and because he saw it pleased the Jews, he proceeded further to take Peter also. Then were the days, notice this, then were the days of unleavened bread. Unleavened bread in the Hebrew is hagamatzah. Matzah is that word you hear, and it's the unleavened bread. And so hagamatzah is the feast of unleavened bread. And so Notice this, the Feast of Unleavened Bread. Now, this is Pesach. Pesach, this is Passover. You have the first day of unleavened bread called pa the Passover, when the, pas the, lamb, the Passover lamb is sacrificed. And then you have, uh, after he's in the, you know, and when he's buried and he's in the grave, the second day is called, uh, the first day of that in the grave is called Feast of Unleavened Bread. It continues on until the resurrection. And after the resurrection, Hagamatsa continues on. It's now called the counting of the Omer. It's con it continues on for 50 days, which is, uh, uh, you, which is in the, the Hebrew, uh, the 50 days. Well, of course, in English, we would say, it, we take it from Penta. In English, we would say Pentecost. In the Hebrew, of course, it would be Shavuot. Shavuot is, Shav is the day of Pentecost. It's, the, it's, the Pent it's Pentecost. The Greeks called the Hebrew Shavuot Penta. In English, it's Pent because Penta means 50. So it's Pentecost, 50 days from the, the, the resurrection of Yeshua. Now, Jesus, the Messiah, Remember, he was impaled. He was crucified on the cross, taken down, buried. There was a high Sabbath. Sabbath. That's the special one. Then there was the, there was the uh, seven-day Sabbath. The high Sabbath, they took him down from the, the cross so they could get him in a tomb before sunset because the high Sabbath, which is a special Sabbath, there are several of those in the scriptures that takes place every year, that take place every year. And so there were two Shabbats, two Sabbaths, within a four-day period. So he was buried. They got him in the grave. Now it's Feast of Unleavened Bread. That's the High Sabbath, first part. Then there are two more days, Feast of Unleavened Bread. And that's at that point in time. Um, you have the first day of the week, which is the seventh-day Sabbath. And so at the end of the seventh-day Sabbath, Jesus was raised from the dead. And now, here we have, let me continue on here, because we have Feast of Unleavened Bread. And verse 4 says this, And when, he had apprehended, when they had apprehended him, he put him, I'm sorry, when he, 
talking about you know uh, Herod. When he had apprehended him, he put him in prison and delivered him to four quadrants of soldiers to keep him, intending after Easter to bring him forth in uh, to bring him forth to the people. Now this is the uh, unauthorized King James version of the Bible, and this is literally wrong. It's literally an error. There are no errors in the Word of God, but you have to watch some of the translations. And this is an intended error, because Easter is no, you read, pull up any Bible you have and read that same verse, and you'll see Passover. You will not see Easter, because it's the Greek Pascha, and Easter is not Pascha. It's a pagan holiday, pagan religion. So you won't find this. Now, if the King James is right, every other version, including the Greek and the Hebrew, is wrong. So I'm bold enough to tell you that and pull out, show you in the scriptures. All right? So now, just, just so that you know what I'm talking about here when it says this, now pull up another version. If you have another version. Okay. What does it say? Now, somebody is lying. Passover is not Easter. Passover is Pascha, and it's, and, and, uh, you know, it's, you know, Passover is Pesach. It's Passover. It's not Diana. It is not um, Semiramis. It is, <laughs> it is not, you can mention all the different female goddess names. And then, finally, you have the Oshtar and Ishtar and Easter. So they slipped that one in, the King James. Now, once again, if the King James, which is a translation, now the original, the early manuscripts, the Hebrew, the Greek, some Aramaic, that's the Bible. We translate what we call our Bibles from that, thank God, and, and it is mostly correct. But I'm a scholar in Hebrew, Aramaic, and Greek. And if I'm going to spend my life in the Word of God, I want to know the Word of God. It's like I read music. If I'm spending my life doing a great deal with music, I need to know the language of music. It's so like I'm a doctor. Spend my life in medicine, I need to know the language of medicine. I don't need to have somebody else try and give me bits and pieces of interpretation of the language. I need to know the language if I'm going to be a professional in something. So in preaching the word of God, going back to where it was written in, I need to know the language of the word. And that enables me when I come across a weak version. Now, King James is a strong version. And you'll find a few places in the King James uh, that is questionable. But when you get to NIV and a few others, you find some things. Well, especially when you go to the, <laughs> to the uh, revised standard, it is so watered down that it's a mess. And, uh, but once again, when you say Bible, people can get upset because you're touching on things that they've been taught all their life. Who hasn't been taught, who in the Protestant realm, that Easter is the time to celebrate the resurrection? Well, we can celebrate it any day we want to. Go ahead and celebrate it any of those times, but don't ignore the biblical time. See, we do that with the birth of Jesus. We celebrate Christmas, but we totally bypass Feast of Tabernacles which is the time he was literally born. Yes, we do know precisely when Jesus was born. It's not a guess. We know it from the time that Zacharias was in the temple in the priestly order, and his ministry there, you can read it very clearly, is, was, uh, he was to, to minister incense and have the burning of incense around the altar. In fact, that's where the angel appeared to him, to tell him that he and Elizabeth were going to have John, John the Baptist. And he didn't believe him, so he was mute until John was, and not only until he was born, but after he was born, he was mute until uh, uh, John, till eight days later when he, he had to be circumcised, and then they would name the boy, they would name the child. And that's when Elizabeth said, Elizabeth said his name is John, they said, nobody in your family has that name. So they asked Zacharias, and he asked for something to write on. So he wrote down, his name is John. 
And then he could speak. At that moment, his tongue was loosed. And the man began to prophesy, <laughs> hallelujah, about Jesus and about what John would, would, how John would be involved in, in uh, the life of Jesus. So we know, I don't, I, th that would be for a Bible school or something or a Bible study to take us through the priestly orders and what time of the year each head of the family and the, 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 the family of the Kohanim would go into and serve into the, and serve in the temple during the priestly order. And they would do it twice a year, in the first six months, the second six months. Then on all the Moedim, all the holy days, they would all serve together. So when Zacharias was there, Zacharias was there, or we know the time, and then six, and then after he left, his period was, was over, six months later, I mean six months later, after the angel comes to Mary and tells her that she's going to be impregnated with the Messiah, Mary, he tells her about Elizabeth, that she is now six months pregnant. And so the Messiah is conceived six months into Elizabeth's pregnancy. Mary was with her for approximately three months, the scripture says, and then she left, and then Elizabeth had the child. So between the ninth and tenth month, here it is, Elizabeth now is giving birth. Now, when she gives birth, Mary is a little over three months into her pregnancy. Track that on up, nine months up, you come to, you, you pass Pesach, and you, come, you pass Shavuot, and you come to uh, Sukkot, which is Feast of Tabernacles. And that's when Jesus was born. We know exactly when he was born. Now, in the Western world, we'll say the shepherds were in the field and the, you know, attending their flocks by night, and we got December out of that. And it's cold in December. Shepherds are not in Israel. They're not in the field. And they don't have the sheep out there, and they're not in the field in winter watching over flock. So on the Julian Gregorian calendar, it fluctuates his birth between the last week of September and the first week of December. But on the Semitic calendar, we know when he was born. So that's pretty amazing, isn't it? Hallelujah. <laughs> so when I say we can celebrate him at any time, but don't, we haven't been taught mostly. The generations before us, have, 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 they just haven't taught us, you know, whether you're Baptist or Pentecostal or Catholic or Charismatic or... <laughs> you know, you get into all the different other little branches, whether you're a Calvinist or Armenian, Armenian or what have you, just haven't taught the body of Christ the biblical foundation of these things so that, I, I, you know, I'm like, I'm like the, the, uh, the, the psalmist, you know, uh, this is the day that the Lord has made. Let us rejoice and be glad in it. Put me down for every day. Even, you know, every day I want to magnify the Lord. But on those special times that he says, he has multifold in the scriptures. When you read it out and you study it, there are multifold blessings for the believer when we meet with him on these special times. And the devil wants us to be ignorant of them because he'll try to get us to think, oh, that's just law. That's just, we don't call it Christmas law, do we? <laughs> oh, that's just a custom. We don't say that, you know, we don't criticize Christmas or Easter or Valentine's Day or what have you, you know, we just go ahead and partake, partake, partake in those. Well, why not partake in the biblical celebrations? Because says, God says, for one of the things he says is there are household blessings that you don't get at any other time except those times. Now, why would, now you can see how Satan would convince you that, oh, it's law, stay away from it. When God is saying, I have a whole gamut of blessings to give you. <laughs> And that's the only time you're going to get them. These are my special times for you. And then he says, he, he, he began to speak about things that he will do in the family and personal things he will do for each one of us if we honor him and meet with him on the appointments that he sets. But Satan wouldn't want you to know that. He would cloak it and say that into in religion and say, oh, that's just religious stuff under the law. And... 
and we miss all these goodies that God has for us. Praise the Lord. You think you get some goodies on Christmas Day when the gifts are passed out. Just think about if you meet with God on those special times that he says. God's gifts are much better than any gift of man. It's really incredible. So here, when he set this on the day of Pascha, uh, in, in Acts chapter 12, verse 4 here, intending after Easter to bring him forth to the people. Uh, he was afraid to, to actually do anything before the Passover because the people, you know, their focus was in, in the right place. And so he wanted to wait until after Passover to do this. Now, going back to Luke chapter 2. Now, this is just the background here, there in Luke chapter, that part. It says that Jesus grew, and year after year for 12 years, now Jesus grew. Remember, he grew in several things. He became strong in spirit. He was filled with wisdom, and the favor of God was upon him. The grace, the favor of God was upon him. Grew in spirit, right? strong in spirit, grew in wisdom, and favor, the favor of God. It's good. The scripture tells us to have the favor of God and the favor of man. But Jesus had the favor of his father, even at times when he didn't have the favor of man. And he was always victorious. Always victorious. Now, here in verse, let's go on down here. It says in verse 43, And when they had fulfilled the days, as they returned, the child Jesus tarried behind in Jerusalem, and Joseph... And his mother knew it not. I want to pause on that verse because that's, that was the lead in, and I won't get too far on it, but here's the aspect. It is important to have a prayer life. And when I say a prayer life, I don't mean just a prayer time, but a prayer life. Because there lies, therein lies the presence of God. Hear me on this. This is the most important thing aside from inviting Jesus into your heart as your Lord and your Savior. It is having a prayer life. It is more important than anything else. It's more important than a husband or a wife. It's more important than being a father or a mother or being a son or a daughter. It is more important than church. It is more important than all of the fellowship we have together. It is more important than anything because prayer, number one, is a dialogue with God. It's not a monologue. Most often in the body of Christ, we kind of treat it like a monologue. You know, we'll come together and we'll say we're going to have a prayer meeting. And what do we do? We shout and we dance and we pray and we fall out and everything else. And the louder we are in the prayer meeting, the better. And when that hour or two is over, or that hour is over, those two hours are over, and we've gotten a blessing, we feel good. We go home and we'll say, wasn't that a good prayer meeting? And God is saying, I didn't get to say much. So where's the dialogue? Hallelujah. <laughs> it's a monologue. Now, the way that God dialogues oftentimes with people who don't listen, uh, the way he monologues with people who often don't um, take the time to hear his voice and hear his word in a distinct way, through the word of God, that is, is through the manifestation of signs, wonders, and miracles, and is very powerful. But usually when we experience a miracle, we'll say, oh, that was a good prayer meeting. Well, it was. And God talked back, but it was through the signs, wonders, and miracles. But we'll leave with that, like the children of Israel did, and rebel. They saw miracles constantly in the wilderness. They had manna every day. That was a miracle every day, except for... the. The Shabbat, it didn't fall, but they took enough on the day before the Sabbath, so it, it fell on the Sabbath. So we do know when the Sabbath was. It was the seventh day of the week, not the first, but go ahead. We celebrate the first. Anytime we call it Sunday, that was a Greco-Roman thing. We celebrate because every day is the Lord's day. But 
that seventh day, even on our own Julian Gregorian calendar, falls on Saturday. That's the seventh day. Check your calendar, and you'll see Sunday is the first day. And then people will say, well, the Bible, the Bible says, well, Paul took an offering on the first day. You know, when he was going to leave that area and not return, and the guy fell off, off the loft up there, and he died. Paul went down and raised him from the dead. And he preached all night, and Sunday morning had occurred, or the first day of the week, and he left that area never to return. That was his last time, and he had a long sermon. Put somebody to sleep. Guy slept so long he fell and died. <laughs> I mean, that's a, you think about a, ser, a, a, a sermon like that, you don't want people to die and listening to your sermons, you know. But that happened with, with, with Paul. No problem. He went down because God was speaking through his servant you know, through preaching and teaching, that's God still speaking through prophecy, etc. Et he's speaking. So he went down and it just uh, yielded to the Lord, and the Lord worked a miracle through him. And the guy was raised from the dead. Then Paul went right back up, went on preaching. I don't think anybody else was sleeping after that. They were wondering, well, or maybe they were looking around going, yeah, old well, Mr. Peabody over there, you know, he falls asleep too. Let's see if he's going to fall, especially the, the teenagers and the kids, you know, they're watching perhaps. But he was the only one that, that fell and died and was raised from the dead. Now, this por portion that I'm talking about here is regarding, you know, it's not about spending a lot of time on all the holy days and things like that or the Sabbath. Every day we have a special day with God. It's not just Passover or Feast of Tabernacles or Pentecost. Pentecost has become a denomination now. Pentecost was happening 2,000 years before the book of Acts in Acts chapters 2 through 4, and what we now say the church was born. You mean there was no church <laughs> all those thousands of years? It's amazing how we as Christians do. Bible school tells us the church was born on Pentecost. Well, Pentecost was 2,000 years. That took place, the first Pentecost, Shavuot, was in the desert with Moses and the children of Israel. And when they say the church fathers, and you would go back to the various names, and you know, we'll go back to Augustine and some of the others, and, and those are the church fathers. Well, <laughs> if you really want to talk about church fathers, how about going back to Abraham, Moses, Elijah, Elisha? How about going back to the, the church mothers? Back in the day, that we talk about the church fathers, not much about the church mothers. But how about Miriam? You know, how about uh, you know when you're coming through there talking about the church mothers? How about Ra uh, Rahab? Uh, how about um, Rebecca, Sarah? You know, we're talking about the church mothers. How about Ruth? Yeah, the church mothers. How about Esther? You're talking about church mothers. That woman, because she obeyed God, it saved the whole nation. When was the last time one of us men did that? You know? But so those were the church mothers and fathers. Now, later on, of course, you had new ones to come along, but usually in Christianity, we don't refer to the real church fathers and mothers. We go back and pull out a few historic figures, you know, and talk about them. But <laughs> I don't learn much about the faith from Augustine. There were 13 points. Augustine and Calvinists took six of them and made it a major doctrine for uh, the Calvinists, those who, the churches that believe in Calvinism, you know, and so on like that. Uh, <laughs> there were 13. 13, so they left seven out because those seven, they didn't agree with those seven, but Augustine really had it right on those six. <laughs> Isn't that something? He was anointed on those six. We don't know where the anointing went on those other seven. Oh, bless God. Now, that's a little foundation aspect here. Now, let me, now, so worship God every day. It's, worship is supposed to be a constant thing. Prayer is constant. It's monologue, but we talk to God, and it says in Luke chapter 18, verse 1, several places he tells us this in Thessalonians as well as Luke, and, uh, and other places too, that men ought always pray and not faint. Always, always. Now, I cannot always pray 
I mean 24-7, verbally. And if God is speaking to us 24-7, verbally, we might hear, but we won't distinguish his voice because we talk to one another. We hear other voices. Our minds wander onto other things. We think about our children, things on the job. We, you know, there are different things. So how do you pray always? How do you pray? How do you rejoice evermore and pray without ceasing? Well, one of the ways is, is, is uh, laid out for us in, in um, Hebrews chapter 12. I'm sorry, Romans chapter 12, verse 1. I beseech you, therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that you present your bodies a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable unto God. This is King James, which is your reasonable service. Now, the Hebrew says your logical temple worship. The Greek says your spiritual, your act of, your, your spiritual act of worship. Now, let's go to another version and see how close it is to the Hebrew and the Greek on this. It is logical, logical, and that's why King James put reasonable, reasonable service, like ministry, service, so we're ministering unto the Lord. And now when you're looking at, what is that one called, the New English Translation? It said, therefore I exhort you, brothers and sisters, by the mercies of God, to present to your bodies as a sacrifice, alive, holy, and pleasing to God, which is your reasonable service. You have another one? I said, okay, let's put another one up there. That's close to the King James. Put up the NIV or something like that, and you'll, you'll see. Because you, you have a number that have the reasonable service, and then you have others also that have, um, have it more in depth. Now, let's look at this. This is what the, the Tree of Life version. I urge you, therefore, brothers and sisters, by the mercies of God, to present your bodies as a living sacrifice, wholly acceptable to God, which is your spiritual service. Now, the, the, the um, um, I would just say the complete Jewish translation would put it more like your temple, logical temple worship. The NIV, do you have that one? You know, that one has, I believe it has, it quoted this way, your logical, if you pull that up, it says your, I mean, your, that would say something about your temple worship, I believe it is, or your, um, something about your spiritual, this is spiritual service and worship. So we see that what is reasonable is spiritual. It is not carnal. So our bodies are to be a spiritual service unto God or spiritual worship unto God. And how does your NIV have it there when, once you come to that one? I know all these different versions and so forth. But we have it from the Hebrew and the Greek, your logical temple worship, or your spiritual act of worship, and so on. And so the new international version of the Bible is kind of hard getting there, isn't it? <laughs> okay, come up real quick and, and read it. So I'm almost out of time. It says, therefore, I urge you, brothers and sisters, in view of God's mercy to offer your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and pleasing to God. This is your true and proper worship. Thank you. Hallelujah. So I want you to see. Now, all of these versions are right. You just have different aspects of it brought out. But our bodies, the point I'm getting across here is that our bodies are supposed to be worship. A living sacrifice. That means every day, whether you are asleep or awake, our bodies are to be worshiping God. Well, how do we do that? We can't do it verbally. We can't do it by lifting the hands all the time, yada, toda, you know, uh, in, in, in halal and so forth, the different aspects of praise like that. Those are praise words, but baracha, barach, to kneel, a worship God, baracha, baracha, to worship God. How do we do that? Well, a living sacrifice means we do what Luke chapter 9, verse 23 says. Jesus says, if any man would come after me, let him deny himself, take up his cross daily, and follow me. Now, if you're reading Matthew and Mark, it doesn't have daily in there. Luke completes it there. Luke says, take up his cross daily and follow me. So that's a living sacrifice. 
when we're living righteous, when we are just living our life pleasing as is pleasing unto the Lord, we are living a holy life before God. That's worship. With the body, keeping the body pure, I mean, keeping our thoughts and so forth and, and not falling into temptations and being led like a sheep to a slaughter, you know, into various temptations, that's worship. Worship is not all, see, there are different types of prayer. There's praise when we give accolades, when we boast about God to God and to people, and we can do that also uh, without words. But we can, and we can have thankfulness in our hearts. See, there's a level of prayer that the enemy, two, two, in two ways that the enemy, uh, well, actually, three, that the enemy doesn't know what's happening. He doesn't know what you're saying. And one of those ways, he doesn't even necessarily know you're praying. But in Acts chapter, is that chapter 8, verse 28, or chapter 6, verse 28, when he talks about the Holy Spirit will come alongside us as our helper in prayer. When we know not what to pray for, I believe is, you're holding up the sign with the question I just said, is it Acts chapter, uh, <laughs> chapter 28, verse, uh, verse, it will be around uh, verse uh, 26. It's either Acts 28, 26, or act, uh, not Acts, I mean Romans 28, 20, Romans 8, 26, or Romans 6, 26. It will be one of those two with that verse in it. I have so much of the Bible memorized. Every once in a while, you, you get the, the references crossed. But you know, the reference is not Scripture anyway. It's the word that Scripture meant, but the reference in there so that we could find it easily. <laughs> If all you're doing is memorizing a lot of references, please memorize the verses. Because if you say to the devil, according to John 3.16, the devil can say, whoop de doo But if you say, for God so loved the world, the devil, ah, because now you're quoting the word. The references are man-made. The word is God. Hallelujah. So here we are in 826. I had it right the first time. Okay. Likewise, the Spirit also helpeth our infirmities when we know not what to pray, uh, what we, when, we knew, when we know not what we should pray for as we ought. But the Spirit, here it says, itself, that's another error in the King James. Any other version you read, it will have it just like it is in the Hebrew and the Greek. It's the Spirit himself. It's a neutered noun. It's not simply an it. The Holy Spirit is God. When we read the rest of the scriptures, we see that. The Holy, Jesus referred to him, when you're reading John chapter 16, every time he refers to him, he says, he. He said, it's important that I go away. If I don't go away, the Father, or Father will not send the Spirit to you. And when he has come, he will testify of me in John chapter 15, verse 26. John chapter 16, he says, when he comes, he will teach you all things. And bring to your remembrance, no, that's John 14, uh, um, John 14, 16, and bring to your remembrance all that I've said. In John 14, 26, those two verses. But in John chapter 16, Jesus says, all that the Father has is mine. That's why I said to you, the Spirit will take which is mine and will show it unto you. For he will not speak of himself, but he will speak what he hears of, of Jesus and what he hears of the Father. So the Holy Spirit is referred to not as an it. This is the only time you see him as an it, and it's in a King James, the same unauthorized King James version that has Easter. Okay? I'm telling you as an authority on the scriptures. And so when people, you know, when the song, send it on down, send it on down, Lord, let the Holy Ghost come on down, well, you send him on down, not it. So people think they're quoting the word when they put that error that's there in there. Now, when you say send it on down, you can say, Lord, send the power. The power of the Holy Ghost coming down. Now, that's it, the power. But the Holy Ghost himself is not an it. Praise God. He says, but the Spirit himself maketh intercession for us with groanings, groanings which cannot be uttered. So now you see another type of prayer. What is it? It's intercessory prayer. Worship, we can worship 24-7, asleep or awake. Just live righteous. 
Go to bed having, having, having not, go to bed having lived free of fornication, adultery, free of, of gossip and slander and hatred and resentment toward people and carrying a, carrying a root of bitterness and plotting and planning to, to, to destroy the lives of people. You go to bed free of all of that. That's spiritual worship. So we can worship all the time. That's a type of prayer. Praise is another type of prayer. Intercession is another type of prayer. Thanksgiving is another type of prayer. But I brought this part out because it says, He maketh intercession for us with groanings which cannot be uttered. Now, the devil doesn't know what's happening there. That's one of those types of prayer that you can be involved in prayer and, and he doesn't know what's going on. He says... Likewise, the Spirit himself helpeth. I've talked about that word before, our infirmities. The Greek word here for infirmities is asthenia. Asthenia or asthenios. That takes in every type of sickness, disease, depression, pressure, anxiety, every type of overtiredness of the body, mind, or spirit. It takes in every type of, of a supernatural ailment that's come against a person, Asthenia, that's the one that Paul said, when I am asthenia, when I am when I'm weak, then I'm strong. For Christ is made strong in my asthenia, in my infirmities. That's every type of weakness. Now you get into all the other categories of diseases, but this one takes in every kind. Mark chapter 16. When Jesus ends there, and he tells the disciples to, after he has sins, and they went out working signs and wonders and so forth, and he said to them, lay hands on the sick, and they shall recover. That was a specific type of sickness, a, category, a specific category of sickness. That was a, a category called uh, aristos. That's a whole category in the Greek. That's not every type of sickness. Lay hands on the sick, and they shall recover. That's aristos. Then you get over to the healing aspect. So now when you hit the word infirmities, that takes in everything that's out there. Now all the aristos is going to fall under that. All the cacos, which is demonic. See, you can be sick in your body and have medication for it. You can have, take vitamins, minerals, supplements, and have all the medical help you want and not get better. And that can fall under a couple of categories in the scriptures. It can be mastigos which is a certain type of plague that the woman with the issue of blood was healed of. It could be cacos, cacos, demonic forces. You can do everything naturally and holistically and medically and still be sick if a demon is behind it. See, that's why in, Dr. in Brother Hart's meetings, when medicine didn't do it, people got off crutches. I'm serious about this. When, when medicine didn't do it, they got out of wheelchairs. Wheelchairs. Why is that? Because that is a type of malachion, that paralysis and so forth in the body and, and, and debilita debilitates your limbs and so forth. A whole category of sickness, the Greek word, in the scriptures that people in church don't know about. We just lump it all together and we wonder why we don't get healed. That's why Jesus went about teaching and preaching, and then he healed. That's why Oral Roberts would teach during the day and have the healing service at night. People focused on the night service, but they missed the ones who are watching by TV. They didn't realize all the teaching that went on during the day. That's why Kenneth Hagin would teach, 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 and then people would get healed. Because if they didn't know what they had, they would lose it. They'd end up giving it up. And so the Holy Spirit, and this word help is the word, it's, it's a compound word that is not seen anywhere else in Scripture. You see parts of the word. You see lambano, which is to cast or to take hold of or to seize. And you see soon, you see soon, which we translate when we spell it S Y N. In the Greek, the Y has the sound of U. So we will say synchronize. In the Greek, you would say soon, not sin, not sin. But we say it's sin in English. Symphony. 
instead of symphony. So the word soon means soon means together. It's coming together with someone. Anti, anti or anti, means against. This Greek word, compound word, that's for help, and this is the only place you see it, and it's regarding the Holy Spirit, sunantilambonetai. Sunantilambonetai means the Holy Spirit. When we don't know what to pray for as we ought, the Holy Spirit comes along soon together with us, alongside and together and links with us. Anti, he links with us. He's together with us against Lambanonetai, he's together with us against to snatch, to literally take by whatever force or means necessary, whatever infirmity that's come against us to take that thing out of our lives, get rid of it, and snatch, hallelujah, our health back. The Holy Spirit comes alongside us to forcefully gather with us against to snatch away and take away what the infirmity has robbed us of or stolen from us and kick that infirmity out. When we don't know what to pray for and how to do it, the Holy Spirit comes along and God never ever denies his prayers. The Father doesn't. And he does it with groanings that can't be articulated. The devil doesn't know what he's saying. People don't know what he's saying. You don't even know what he's saying. I don't know what he's saying because I don't know what to pray for as I ought. But he does that. And it's, words that, it's, it's in words that cannot be articulated. It's not just some kind of physical groan, oh, but it's a groaning, that's just the spirit. So it's a groaning in the spirit. That's different from the Holy Spirit using our bodies to groan, like speaking in tongues, he'll use, but a groaning in the spirit. And then the next verse talks about God knowing the mind of the spirit and all of that. So this is powerful. This is a type of prayer. Another type of prayer is when we're in, in, in uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 14, when we are having the prayer language. See, that's where people get mixed up in church. They think if you speak in tongues in church, you must always interpret. Well, yeah, that's when the Holy Spirit is speaking to us and God is speaking through us. But when God gives us a language via the Spirit, that we are praying in tongues, a tongue that are mysteries, that we don't know what it is. The devil doesn't know what it is. It says in chapter 14 of 1 Corinthians, only God knows. So the devil doesn't get the, the opportunity to understand that type of prayer. Two types of prayer the Spirit's involved there. The devil doesn't get to, to get involved with that. So you can pray that way and get answers and surprise the devil all the time and surprise the natural all the time. Praise God. And that's not only intercession, but it's all types of prayer. And then that third type is when you say in your heart, you speak in your spirit, and you speak it in your mind and your spirit. Jesus perceived the thoughts of people's hearts. I could give you scripture after scripture where he perceived their thoughts and where he heard what they were saying, what they were speaking. Those were not verbal words but they were words in their heart. Now, out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaks, but there's an abundance in the heart that you can speak without it being verbal also. And Jesus, hearing their thoughts, or Jesus, hearing what they were saying, remember he heard what Simon was saying when Mary broke that alabaster box. To pour that ointment, that, that perfume on the feet of Jesus. This is Mary. She's not Mary of Magdala, Mary Magdalene. This is Mary, the sister of Lazarus. She not only, twice it talks about her putting in the oil being on his feet and her wiping it with her hair, but once it talks about her anointing his head and it was for burial. That's the same situation. This alabaster bar, box of oil that, that uh, Judas talks about, you know, could be sold. You know, and I could get a lot of money for it. In other words, Jesus, he said, why are they wasting it on you? <laughs> Anything you pour on Jesus is not a waste. Whew, it's the best thing we could do. And so Jesus said, you don't know what's happened here. She's done this for my burial. But he heard what they were saying. 
he heard what Simon was saying in his heart, if he knew what kind of woman this is. Now, King James adds in Matthew that when they were in Bethany and Jesus was at the house there and it was Lazarus, Mary, and Martha, and Martha was busy uh, making uh, meals. She did that more than once. She did it more than once. And now in that situation, that's when uh, the King James was in there that Simon, the father of Judas Iscariot. Now, historically, Simon is the father of Judas Iscariot. But when you look in the Greek, it doesn't really say the, the father. So when you see the parenthesis or brackets in the King James, that means they add that to interpret it for you. So if they would say, uh, Jesus, the Messiah, then they would say, which is the Christ? Which is the Christ is not in any of the manuscripts. That is their way of interpreting what Messiah means. So it's important to know what the word is and the interpretation man puts in there, the brackets and so forth. Okay? <laughs> and so, but it's for our clarity. They're doing it hoping that they can help somebody. And oftentimes, if we get tripped on, up on that and that becomes the doctrine instead of the verse before or after, we can get in a little spiritual situation where the enemy can say, aha, I have an advantage. And we don't want that. So we want to have that, those things there for clarity, but that's King James Version I'm talking about there. But we want to make sure that we know what the word is saying. Okay? So Messiah it didn't have to put being translated as Christ because the King James is a translation, you know, from the Greek and, and the Hebrew. And Mashiach is Messiah. And so the, the English bring it over and just, why didn't they just say Jesus Christ or the Christ? Not Jesus the Messiah, which is interpreted the Christ, you know, or trans, you know, like that. So they put it there so that we would know what to say it. Now, I realize that, you know, I'm not just preaching, preaching. I love to do it. But, you know, in the past few years, there's been such a need for God's people to be rooted and grounded in the word of God. We know how to shout. We know how to praise. We know how to fall out. We know how to receive miracles. But we don't know how to walk victorious. We don't. And when we, if I had the time to bring out scriptures, when we're praying, when we're speaking, and when we're dealing with the devil, in Ephesians chapter 6, sometimes I'll get to do that, you'll find out when you're looking in the Greek there that we are not fighting a war to get victory. We're not fighting spiritual battles and all of this to get victory. We're fighting spiritual battles from the standpoint and from the point of victory. We are victorious in Christ. So every battle we fight from the word of God, this is literally the word of God when you go to the Greek. We are fighting it with the advantage. We are fighting it from the advantage of already having the victory. So that we don't go into warfare looking for victory. Go, we go in from a point of victory to seize what we are already victorious over. It's like a 12-year-old walking up to a 2-year-old with a toy. And the 12-year-old already knows if this is a 12-year-old's toy and he wants it back, he's not strategizing how am I going to get it unless he doesn't want to hurt the little one's feelings. He'll just walk up from a point of victory and just snatch it. One of my grandsons, Elijah, when he was four, hello, Elijah, when he was four years of age, he's 22, 23 now, was standing in one of my restroom, my bathroom doors, and his little sister, Holly, which was six, wanted to go in. She had to potty. She had to potty real bad, you know, when the girls are doing this, you know, and she's pleading with Elijah to let her in. Elijah blocked the door and said, no. <laughs> and I heard it, and she's, now she's two years older than he is, but he's standing and I walked up and said, Elijah, she has to go in and use the restroom. Would you let her in? He said, no. I said, Elijah, she has to. And the Lord just spoke to me and said, why are you reasoning with a four-year-old? I just reached down and picked him up. 
I took care of the problem. And when I sat him down, he went over to a corner and went, <clears throat> but within two minutes, he was back to playing again, you know, he's four years of age. So I didn't try to reason with him, hoping to get victory in that for Holly, his six-year-old sister. I reached down from a point of victory and removed the obstacle for, that was in Holly's way so she could go in and relieve herself. Thus, that's a graphic view, but that's what we have in Christ Jesus. We do not, the weapons of our warfare are mighty through God to the pulling down of strongholds. We are not hoping for mighty weapons, they already are. We go in from a position of strength and a position of victory and we seize and we take back what has been taken from us. And so when we pray, we are to move, hallelujah, oh hallelujah God. We are to move into all of these realms of prayer where you, the Holy Spirit prays for us with groanings that can't be uttered. But he doesn't just come and look at you and decide to pray. He comes and he joins together with you. And when you have on the whole armor of God, the Holy Spirit doesn't need to try and put on some armor. He is God. So he armors you. He tells you to put on the armor he has. And now you come together as one. And you come together as one against whatever has attacked you. And whatever is lacking now, because the attacker has somehow gotten it either as a thief or a robber or being stronger than a strong man in a house, but if a stronger one comes along, he can take all of his goods. If you don't realize the strength you have, the enemy will come along and act stronger and take what you have. Then the Holy Spirit will come to you and say, wait a minute, that's yours. You're stronger than that. You're stronger than he is. Let's take it back. So you begin to pray, and you don't know how to pray. Sometimes it's not even words. You don't say words. There have been times when I prayed, and I just said, Lord, uh, uh, and I'm praying. On the inside, I'm going, uh, you know. And at that very second, I know the Holy Spirit has joined with me, and he is praying with me. Words that I don't know. They're not even coming out of me. I don't hear them. I don't even hear the groans. But I have the satisfaction in my spirit to know that sunanti lamboletai, the Holy Spirit has come along beside me in that way and he is making intercession for me. He is here with me making intercession and what he hears is what he speaks. And, and Jesus is at the right hand of the Father ever making intercession. So it's covered on earth and it's covered at the throne. How can you lose? You're, you're, you're speaking forth from a point of victory. And at that point, I'm going, ah, oh, Lord. I, and he knows what to pray. And he prays. And I'm, and I'm satisfied in my spirit by faith because I know I have the answer. Because that prayer went beyond even me speaking in tongues. That prayer went beyond me getting other people together to pray. That was a unity prayer with the Holy Ghost. And two prayers you know will never be unanswered. And that's the prayer of Jesus and the one who is just like him that he said he would send another just like him. And that's the Holy Ghost. The Father will never deny them. In those areas and positions, you'll never deny the personification of Jesus or the Holy Spirit. And so when they're both praying for us, that's intercess intercessory prayer. The Holy Spirit is interceding. And Jesus is seated at the right hand of the Father, interceding. And the Holy Spirit doesn't speak of his own. He's only going to speak what he hears. So what he's hearing Jesus say, he's echoing it back, but he's echoing it from the standpoint that he knows all about us. And then the Father knows all about the Holy Ghost. And because the Holy Spirit, it says in the very next verse, so he intercedes. Let's go to the next verse there. He intercedes according to the will. Notice this. And he that searcheth the hearts knoweth what is the mind of the Spirit, because he maketh intercession for the saints according to the will of God. There's no missing. 
It's not if it be thy will, or I hope this is God's will, or I'm praying in the right context, I'm hoping. The Holy Spirit is always in context, and he's always praying according to the will of God. And never does a prayer of his go unanswered by the Father. And so when he comes alongside us, back in verse 26, and he's our helper, he's our sunanti lambonetai, he's the one who comes with us, forcefully with us, against whatever you're against. So when you get to that place where you don't know how to pray as you ought, it's not a time to try and repent. Oh, God, I don't know how to pray. Just welcome the Holy Spirit because he's right there at that time, and he's saying, I'm, a, I'm stronger than that. I'm stronger than any enemy that would come against you. I'm stronger than, remember, I was with Jesus. It was with him all the way to Calvary, with him all the way to the resurrection of the dead. I was with Jesus. Every miracle Jesus performed, I was there with him. And then Jesus said, there are greater things that you're going to do than he did. And he said, I'm going away, but I'm sending the one who was with him, that was with him all the time, the Holy Ghost. I'm sending him, and now you're going to do greater things. So with him, the, great, the greater things is in the power of the Holy Spirit operating with us, with the authority of Jesus, because Jesus said so. And so you can't lose. You're always standing and walking and battling and fighting and praising from the standpoint of victory. If we could understand that, that the battles are easy because the war has already been won. And we have everything to move in individually and collectively and to take back what is ours, just like a 12-year-old can take his toy from a 2-year-old. And the devil isn't even as strong as a two-year-old against you. <laughs> and, 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 and when I talk about that in prayer, I don't have time today. Jesus giving them power over all the power of the enemy. And so on. I tell you some of the Greek on that. That's over every kind of power. When he says he, he, uh, he took the armor, Satan's armor, away from him. Yes, so that's why I'm moving to a close. He took the armor from him. Thank you, yes. Okay. From Satan. Took all of his armor. But he gave us, God gave us all of his armor. God took all of Satan's armor away. And he gave us all of his armor. So who is armed from head to toe? Why are we running from somebody who's vulnerable from head to toe? When we are armed, fully armed, with strong armor from head to toe. And when I get into that and tell you about it, that armor, what he talks about there, it's not only the word armor, armor and armed, but it is weapon. It is tool. It is instrument. So every instrument God has, every tool God's, God has, every weapon God has, every aspect of that armor there that God has is in the armor. So when you put it on, you've seen spies and so forth. They're pulling. They say, now give me your guns. I said, give me that other one, that knife too. And they say, oh, they're pulling them out of places where, you know, oh, okay, give me that one. Okay, okay, you still have more. Oh, go in and get something else. Well, that's what our armor is like. We have so many weapons, we can't count them. They're more than, God can count the hairs, the number of hairs on your head. The weapons are more than that, the weapons of our warfare, and they are mighty through God. The enemy has, total, has been totally stripped of his authority, power, and his armor, and God has given us all of God's armor. Now, if you're going to go out, it's like going out to fight. I was going to say an ant, but let me move up a little bit. It's like going out. Uh, and fighting, I, I hate to pick on animals, but it's kind of like it. It's like going out to fight a squirrel with a tank. The squirrel is there with a little nut in his or her hands, no defense, and you roll up in a tank. And you unleash your weapons on that squirrel. That's what the believer is like in the face of the enemy. We're like the one in the tank. That's the armor with all the weaponry. And the enemy is like the squirrel. No weapons, no armor. And then he tells us again, once again, in Luke, 
Chapter 10, 19 and 20, behold, I give you power over all the power of the enemy. I give you exousia, authority over all the dunamis, the miraculous powers of the enemy, and nothing shall by any means hurt you. And you think when we get into prayer. Now, this last part about Jesus, I started with it. I'm going to finish with this part in Luke chapter 2, verse 43. And when they had, and when they had fulfilled the days, as they returned, the child Jesus tarried behind in Jerusalem. And Joseph and his mother knew it not, King James Version. This is the part I want us to talk to look at regarding the presence of God. I have a lot more to share on. Looking forward to Sunday with miracles taking place. Yes, literally. But not simply as a show, but God talking back. I'd love to have some time with us to train us in all the ways that God speaks back and how to constantly walk in that fellowship so that when we have revival meetings, we're not the spectators. We're the ones prepared, and the Spirit of God just flows freely through us. I'm looking forward to the time again in services that I'm in and that we're in, where when you're talking, sometimes you just walk in. If you sit next to a person, instantly they're healed. Jesus touched the briar of a coffin and spoke to the young man, his mother's only source of income, her only child. She was a widow, and now her son died. And Jesus said, rise up. And he arose, and Jesus presented him to his mother. Now, he's just walking along. This is all during the situation of Jairus' situation, and then he hears about Lazarus and all of that. And he's coming along now, and he's her- heading over, you know, and now he's coming uh, through an area called Nain, N-A-I-N, and he's coming through, and there's a funeral procession. People didn't invite Jesus to funerals unless somebody was being raised. It's really. When you see Jesus around dead folks, they're getting up. Somebody, somebody in the group is getting up. Maybe not everybody, but somebody is. Yeah. And so, whether it's Lazarus or whomever. So, and so, this guy is raised from the dead by Jesus. I look forward to the time in meetings that we're not having to call out. Even we can have words of knowledge about people being healed, and we're not having them come up in prayer lines to be healed. That's exciting, and that's a part of it, too. But there are so many other levels of it with God, where everybody sitting in a service can just be healed by hearing the word about the presence of God becoming so thick in the place. It's not about one person or anything. It's the presence of God so thick that everybody gets healed. See, that happened with Jesus. There were crowds that came around him, and every person in the crowd, regardless if they were demon-possessed or they were paralyzed or whatever their problem was, whatever the disease or sickness was, every single one, read it in the Gospels. Go back and read Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John over and 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 over again. Just keep on reading it. And you'll see that they were always healed. There was only one place that Jesus couldn't do many mighty miracles. And it was in his own hometown. At a certain point in time in his own hometown. Because it wasn't always that way in his own hometown. It wasn't always, he wasn't always rejected by the Pharisees and the scribes. The message he had at 12, he also had it at 30. They received it when he was 12 and were amazed by it. But at 30, they wanted to kill him for it. Isn't it something? He's in the temple speaking and asking questions, and they are astounded at his words. Now, he comes along, you know, 18 years later, and they're going, hmm, we don't like that. They wanted to kill him now because it's going to mess with our position, our job. It's going to mess with our income. We've got to stop this man. That's religion. Religion. If it doesn't fit my local empire, I won't have any part of it. I've got to stop it, even though God may be in it. But I refuse to get in it. 
Isn't that something? And I'm so glad that Jesus said to his disciples when they said, there are others. And we told them to stop. They were talking about it. He said, he said don't stop them. <laughs> if, he said, if they're not against us, they're for us. Let them speak. Let them preach the word. They don't have to be in your group to do it. He said, I have sheep that are not of this fold. A whole bunch of them. There were times when Jesus did things that they weren't. He said, the book says if they were recorded, that is, John said he supposed the whole world could not contain the books that would be written about him. John chapter 20 and John chapter 21. He mentions that twice near the end of both chapters. But then Jesus talked to people that his disciples were not around. There were times he would slip away and get alone with God in prayer, the Father in prayer. But there were times he would mingle with other folks when the disciples were not around. They went looking for him time after time. And when they found him, he was in prayer. But they don't know what happened between the time he left them and the prayer. But we, we got a glimpse of a few of those times. One was when he's heading into Jerusalem after the Passover. And he's heading over there. He's in Bethany, and then he goes over to Jerusalem, and he tells them, there's going to be a guy with a water pot, and when you go there, follow that guy, and the house he goes in, into, go into that house, and say to the, 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 the head of that house that you have come, and ask, where is the room that you have prepared that you have for the master? And he said, he will point you to the room. Now, that's somebody Jesus had already talked to, and the disciples didn't know anything about it. He had already set it up at this house, at that place. It wasn't sudden to the person, oh, Jesus is going to be here? The guy had the room ready, it said. And then the disciples went up and just prepared the Passover. But everything else was already prepared. Because Jesus had communicated with somebody without the disciples' knowledge. When he said, untie the donkey that I'm going to ride on into Jerusalem. Jesus had obviously communicated with the owner of the donkey because he said, if anybody asks you, just tell them the master ha has need of it. What master? Caesar who? They had talked with Jesus. He didn't say what he was going. He just said, tell them the master has need of it. He didn't say he's going to ride on it. It could have been Caesar wanting it for something. But they just said, okay. Because Jesus communicated with folks without necessarily running it by the disciples. That's why everybody doesn't know everything between you and Jesus, between you and God. But we are going to pray. And I set this part about Mary at the end and Joseph. Why? Because it is important that we don't allow familiarity and assumption to override spiritual knowledge and responsibility and to override commitment. See, for 12 years, Joseph and Mary had gone to the feast. Jesus was a baby, then a toddler, then a little boy, then a medium-sized boy, you know, preteen. Now he's at 12. This has been 12 years journey, going back and forth every year, once a year. So the final thing here is, they were accustomed to Jesus being among the kinfolks and the friends in that, in that little caravan they had traveling from, uh, from Nazareth over to Jerusalem. Now he's 12, and they're familiar with Jesus being in the group, and not once in 12 years has he been lost. So they assumed, based on familiarity, that he would be among his kinfolks or some of his friends as they were traveling back home from Jerusalem after Passover. About a day's journey in, they, they started looking for him, probably as they would normally do, and they couldn't find him. Why? Because they relied on familiarity and assumption. They went a whole day without communicating with Jesus. And those were the people closest to him, his mother and his father. They went a whole day 
without the presence of Jesus. Now, yes, he was in the natural there, but take what I'm saying from this. It went a whole day without the presence of Jesus. And when they went looking for him, they couldn't find him. It took them three days to really find him. Have you ever been that way in prayer? Where it's like there's been such a wall between you and God, it was a struggle to try and connect. If you've had the weight and responsibility like Paul or like Pastor, Pastor Salary and Linda, there have been times, they don't have to tell me about this because they are human beings. There have been times when all of us, no matter how close we've been with God, have had those times when there have been attacks and various things that's happened or, or even sometimes betrayal from people close to us. And it's like we're trying to connect with God, but the wounds, are the, the struggles, not even just the wounds sometimes, but it's just all the fog and all the stuff. And it's like, God, I know you're here, but I'm having a hard time. I, by faith, I know it. But God, ex, it's, uh, by experiencing you on the inside, right now there's a whole struggle and battle going on there. Jesus' mother and father, his earthly father, went a whole day without his presence, and then it took them two more days to find him. They couldn't even find him for three days. They weren't sinning, and neither was he. But they relied on familiarity, and they assumed things that they needed to have verified because it was a responsibility for them with the Messiah. And when they found him, they said, his mother just went like, didn't you know? Joseph didn't say anything. She said, didn't you know? You know you've worried us. And when they had fulfilled the days, now it says, and when they found him, though, you... We've been worrying about you. He said, didn't you know? I must be about my father's business. They didn't understand that. But Mary pondered those things in her heart. Didn't you know that at the bar mitzvah, didn't you know at the age of 12, when a boy becomes a man, that now it's time for me to step out in the ministry of my father? We say the ministry of Jesus, because of his public ministry, started at the age of 30. In Christianity, we say his ministry started at the age of 30. We are correct on the one hand. And that is his ministry to the general public started at 30. But his ministry started with all the leaders at the age of 12. At 12, he sat down to teach and engage the leaders that all the other folks would follow. He did that at 12. He comes along 18 years later and checks on them. And they haven't done any of the stuff, apparently, that he talked about. Now they want to kill him. Because he's doing the stuff they should have been doing. But they, they remain stuck in their religion, and they bypassed Jesus for 18 years. And now they're angry when he starts to speak and when the miracle starts to happen. They don't understand that he's Lord of the Sabbath. So when he... When, the Father releases a miracle through him on the Sabbath. They don't realize it's coming from the Father. And, and somebody gets up there going, oh, he's got people working on the Sabbath. He couldn't be from God. They're so steeped in their man-made traditions that they couldn't see the very things he was trying to get them to see at age 12. Now he's coming to do what they should have been doing for 18 years after they met with him. He stayed behind on Passover, which was all about him in the first place. He's the lamb who would come to take away the sins of the world. So he came and engaged the leaders, the leaders of the leaders of the leaders. And they were amazed at him. And they listened to him. But 18 years later, when he's 30, they don't want any part of him except a few, like Nicodemus, and there were some others, the leaders that came quietly because they didn't want to get put out, and Jesus addressed that and said, if you're ashamed of me before men, I'll be ashamed of you before my father. They, they, they believed in him, but they wouldn't confess him because it meant that they would have been excommunicated from the synagogue by the Sanhedrin council, and they couldn't practice Judaism anymore. And Jesus dealt with them on that dealt with them. But Mary and Joseph 
assumed he was present, and he wasn't. They assumed he was amongst them, and he wasn't. They were accustomed to him being amongst them, and because of that, they just rested in that. Sometimes we won't pray. We just assume God is going to be there in every situation. When he may be there, but he won't act because there are things he won't do unless we do certain things. That's why he said pray. If prayer wasn't necessary, why would he tell the disciples, the harvest is plenteous, but the laborers are few? And Jesus' own words, in conclusion, was pray that the Lord of the harvest. He said pray that the Lord of the harvest would send forth laborers into his harvest, his harvest field. Now, there's Jesus standing there. He said, Jesus, what do we need to pray for? We have you. I mean, my goodness, God knows our thoughts. He said, certain things are not going to happen, even though God is present, unless you do your part. Whew. And so that's very important. We need to study to show ourselves approved, a workman unto God who need not to be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. So when the devil comes against you, you don't cower back and you don't coil up and go oh I'm getting attacked let me call mama daddy let me call sister brother let me call some friends no you realize at that moment in time even if you are half asleep you say I'm half asleep in victory so you can poke a bear where it's while it's sleeping <laughs> you don't want to be around when it awakens because <sighs> you can't outrun it and you can't climb high enough in a tree to get rid of, away from the bear. And if a tree is small enough, I mean, it's weak enough, the bear will shake you right out of it. And then you have a, and it could be a Christian bear. You know that. Some of you are the, it could be a Christian bear. Remember that? Some of you guys, guy gets, a, a, guy, a bear is approaching a guy real fast, and the guy looks up and said, oh, Lord, God, God, please. Please, let this be a Christian bear. The bear comes over to the guy, lays his hands on him, says, Lord, thank you for the food I'm about to receive in the name of Jesus. Thank you for the food. Christian bear. Either way, you are mince meat. Praise God. So we speak from the standpoint of victory. I'm so far out of time with you, but I want you to know this. And let's expect some miracles from God. Let's expect the power of God. Look, I'm, I'm, I'm expecting God to do some things. Sometimes we look back, some of us would say, well, you know, we look at the time when, uh, like the hearts or Brother Updegrove and so forth. Those were men. They have passed on. Their physical bodies are dead. But their ministry still lives on. Amen. Yeah. But they're dead. But one who's greater than Brother Hart is here. Amen. The Holy Ghost. Amen. Jesus. One who's greater than Brother Uptegrove is here. Jesus, the Holy Ghost, the ones that they talked about, the one who flowed through them. Now, I'm here with you to take you to higher levels and deeper depths. But I'm not just going to have you soar. I'm going to have your roots deep. So, Richard, remember, in one of the Star Wars trilogies, or one of the, the episodes, when Yoda walked in the room. Yoda, this little owl, <laughs> walks in the room. All these magical people with power. He walks in, and all he did was this. <clears throat> and they just fell over. Right. Didn't touch anybody. That's his Star Wars movies. Now, which one was that? You remember? That episode three. He just walks in, little Yoda. Boom, boom, boom. They're, boom, boom. they're falling all of there, not even near him. They're, they're about as far from him almost as Richard is from me. And they're just falling over. Power of the force. The good side, they said. Well, the power of the Holy Ghost... The power of God is working through us. And not just one kind of power. I must stop. But I'm going to tell you, we've got kratos. We have got eskus. We have got exousia. We have got dunamis. We have, we have, <laughs> the power is just tremendous that God has given us. I just mentioned four 
categories of the power. Like there are different categories of sickness. There are different categories of the power of God. The same Holy Ghost. We don't know anything about that. Which is, oh God, you've given me power over all the power of the enemy. And nothing shall by any means hurt me. Do you know that's just only two types? Power, the first power in, in Luke chapter 10, verse 19, is exousia. That's an authority, delegated authority. The second is dunamis, miraculous power, that on the day of Shavuot, the Pentecost, we receive that. What about kratos, the kind of power that raises people from the dead? Even dunamis will do that, but kratos is the kind that raised Jesus from the dead in Philippians chapter 1. Are you listening to me? What about this forceful power? And what? Of the power, and then there's another, a deeper force of power that when he talks about uh, the kingdom of God suffer it violence and the violent take it by force. That's a whole nother Greek word for power. There are other types of power. We don't know that. So we just think power is power. We don't know when you go to the Greek, the, e the English says power, but the Greek categorizes these powers. And it's in the scriptures, they are categorized. When you look and you see the word power, we don't even know what kind of power he's talking about. When we see the word sickness or disease, we don't even know what kind he's talking about. When we see the word prayer, we don't even know what kind he's talking about. And so we come to a service, a revival service, or a Holy Ghost meeting, and we just like little children and toddlers, get so happy and thrilled because the music is going and the power of God, some type, is moving, and we're satisfied. But we never grow up because we never walk all over the enemy from a standpoint of victory day after day after day after day, night after night after night after night after night, and Jesus' sickness did not overtake him once. But in the body of Christ, we think we have to live with it. With Jesus, animosity did not overtake him once. A root of bitterness never, ever overtook him. And he came in the form of a man, not as God, but as a man to show us that how he lived through the power of the Holy Spirit, the various powers of God, so could we. And so can we. But religion says differently. Religion says enjoy religion. Enjoy the service. Enjoy the ceremonies. Enjoy the rituals. Enjoy the happiness. But remain ignorant of the power and ignorant of what the, ignorant of what the enemy is trying to bring against you. So when I get us to a point where even five of you have an understanding of a revelation of what I'm talking to you about, then miracles will happen frequently in and through your life. You see, I want you to recognize something. You've had great men and women of God here. But that's one that your pastors believed to be your bishop and their bishop. It wasn't about age, although maybe it was, but I don't think so. It wasn't about how large of a physical ministry you have, but there's something there. They recognized, like the sons of Issachar, the sons of Issachar, they understood the times. There are over 100 people they could have asked. I know that, and they knew that. I wasn't their only choice, but I was, I think I was your first choice. That's, I think that's what you said, the first choice. But they told me, you know, he, Pastor Larry told me that if I didn't say it, then there was another person he had in mind. But I just, right away, I knew, I was waiting. I've been waiting for a long time. I was waiting. And I wasn't, you don't usurp, you just wait. And out of the mouth of two or three witnesses, when they agreed, and, and I, I told them, I said, I've been waiting for you to come to me. And so the mistake would expect me to be another Upgrove or another heart. Their ministries were in their time and limited in such a way. What God has given me is advanced beyond what both of them were doing with 
what you would call a double portion anointing. The first part is the, the challenging part. The miracle part is the easy part. But we want to jump to the miracles without having the training. And that's the first part. And when I'm here, I spend so much time teaching us and training us. Sometimes people say, ah, he went long. I'm not supposed to do what your regular folks do come in here. I'm your bishop to train you. And if you hear what I'm saying, you hear the spirit, it'll make a major difference. I don't go around just shooting out how to air because I don't have to travel anywhere to do anything in, like that in ministry unless the spirit of God moves on me to do that. I don't have to do that. But I'm here. When Pastor Larry asked me one time, I was going to a television network. We were doing a telethon, going out a, a whole week of praise a for, I think it was like uh, 3 billion or so households around the world. He and Pastor Linda were going someplace. Brother Brian, I stayed behind here because all the hotels were full because you couldn't get, you know, at the time, nothing else was there. I stayed at what was the best Western at the time. Brother Brian was here, and he was handling the service, Richard Brian Murray there. And I came in. I called the president of the network. It was the second largest Christian network in the world. Called the president of the network, and I said, one of my dearest friends, I have a strong relationship has asked me to do this, and I know I've committed to you several times, a number of times each year, and this is one of those times. And I said, if you say no, I will tell him no, but I want you to know that I wouldn't even ask you if I could just have the Sunday morning off and arrive in time for the, the night meeting on television. He, without even thinking, he said, he says, you do that for me all the time. He said, I know there are only about three people you do this for. And he was right. One was uh, Dr. Tommy Reed in Archer Park, New York. Dr. Garth Kuntz out of Marion, Illinois at the time. I didn't even do that for Paul Crouch. And his network was bigger. And he had bigger names. He could call up Benny Hinn and, and others. I didn't do that for him. But the third one was Pastor Larry Damron. And I asked him, and he said, go right ahead. Take whatever time you need. So I set aside ministering to over uh, an audience potential. And we know we had an audience of, at a very bare minimal of 200 million. And, and in the United States, it was 20 million. I set that aside because he called, and he asked me if I would do this for him. And I said, absolutely. There's only one thing I have to clear up before I can give you the final answer. And I did it. I called him back and said, I will be there. And so I drove here, did that. Then I drove to an airport and flew out so that I could be where I was supposed to be at that evening. A week later, they rerouted my ticket and flew me back to where my car was so that I could go home. I'm saying to you that I'm your bishop because this is ordained of God. This is not guesswork. I knew it before they knew it. And of course, that's what a bishop would do. If you're going to be a covering, you have to know something before the ones who are coming to you know it. They are seasoned, strong men and women of God. Why would God give them less or the same level of Up to Grove and Dr. Hart, Brother Hart? They were top leaders in their dimensions, in their era. Why would God cheat them? Why would God cheat the people? And get, why would God only give the people Elijah when there could be an Elisha with a double portion? Are you hearing what I'm saying? Amen. So God is expecting the testimonies we talked about. He's expecting that to happen. And the greater things, the greater and the greater and the greater things to happen. But they, if they happen on the surface, then we have been given a fish for a day. 
But if they happen through the teaching, training, and discipline, then we have learned how to fish for a lifetime. Then we don't go to God and say, oh, God, would you heal this person? We just walk up to them like Peter and James, Peter and John, and say, uh, in the name of Jesus, get up, Peter. It's not silver and gold that I have to give you. And they had somebody who said, have I not many? I don't have any for you. This is not what you need. You're sitting here begging, you know, by this gate. So they come by, and the guy's begging for alms, and they say, look, silver and gold have I not. But such as I have, give I unto thee, King James. In the name of Jesus, rise up and walk. They reached out and grabbed that guy, and he jumped up leaping and praising God. Not once did they say, oh, Heavenly Father, in the name of Jesus, would you just release your power right now? Ah, everybody's going crazy, which is fine, because we can do it that way too. But they were walking at a level after just a couple of years with Jesus. Well, they just said, look, man, we have something that you really want, whether you know it or not. You've been looking for this. It's what you need, man. It's what you've been looking for. You're, you're just settling for these, the little coins that they're throwing in here. But look, what we have to give you, you can go out and get as many coins as you want. You can work in all of that. You can do whatever you want. You can start a business. Business in the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth. Rise up and walk. Amen. They did not say, oh, Heavenly Father, in Jesus' name. Oh, God, if you would work a miracle today. God, you know the family. God, you know. And that's appropriate, too. Let me finish. Third closing. When the centurion's servants and the Jewish friends went to Jesus, that's the kind of prayer they prayed. It wasn't in the name of Jesus. They went to Jesus and said, Lord, this man who's not Jewish, he loves our people. He built us a synagogue. That guy paid for a synagogue. One man who is a Roman centurion. Now, that's a blessed man. A Roman, centuri a Roman soldier built them a synagogue. And he said, he deserves for you to come. Jesus didn't say, he's a sinner, he doesn't deserve it. Jesus just went ahead with them. And on the way to the man's house, the man sent some service out. And he said, tell him, please don't come under my roof. It's not an insult. He's saying, I respect him and I honor him. I'm not worthy to have him come under my roof. The Jewish people that he sent said to Jesus, he is worthy because he's built us a synagogue. The man's heart was different. As Jesus was approaching, got near his house, he said, tell him, I'm not worthy. And tell him, that's the reason I sent people ahead, because I wasn't worthy to come. And perhaps he might hear them, that maybe somebody in that crowd would be worthy enough to represent me. I'm not worthy. And then when you got closer to my home, I sent others to reaffirm to you that I am not worthy for you to come under my roof. But all you have to do is speak the word. See, I'm a man under authority, and I have soldiers under me. I do what I'm told, and when I give them one of them a word, they do what they're told. Jesus, you have authority over sickness and disease. All you have to do is speak healing, and just like my servant obeys me, Healing will obey you. Whatever type of healing it is, it will go into my servant and will heal him. You don't have to come under my roof. You don't even come in my you don't even have to come into my yard. All you have to do is send a word. And Jesus turned and he said, He marveled. One of the few few times you see Jesus marveling. You see him wept, weeping at Lazarus' tomb, and yet he knew he was going to raise him from the dead. Jesus marveled, and he said, in the whole nation, all of Israel, the chosen people, the one I came to, came to you first. I haven't found a single one of you with this kind of faith. He said, I haven't seen this type of faith in all Israel, in the whole nation, coming from a Roman centurion, because the guy understood authority and power. And he spoke. Now, there are many words. People say, Jesus, God rarely speaks. You've got a whole book of him speaking. And he has a whole lot more to say. The problem is, we do most of the talking. And then we consider the meeting over when we're done talking. 
But see, when Jesus would find all those times and places to spend time with God, I'll talk about that another time, at another time, he would leave that time period, and God would speak back all day long, all night long. How would he speak? Well, when Jesus walked up to a briar, a coffin that was on it, he spoke to the guy and he got up. He said, I only hear what I see. Here, I only speak what I hear of the Father. I only do what I see of the Father. So the Father obviously said, raise that boy. And Jesus raised him from the dead. That was God speaking. The woman with the issue of blood, God speaking. Tabitha, the ruler of the synagogue, Jairus' daughter, God speaking. All day long, God would speak. The multitudes being healed of all types of diseases, God speaking. Peter walking on the water, God speaking. Multi-thousands being fed, God speaking. He wasn't just speaking verbally, even though he has a whole, he has 66 books wrapped up in one cover, where his word is. But he has so much more to say in so many ways. But we consider the meeting adjourned when we're done. And if we get one or two miracles, it's over. And God is, God is saying, wait a minute, wait, 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 wait. There are 23, 22, 21 more hours left. Let's get some stuff done. Let me talk. Let me speak. Sometimes it's in a thunderous voice where only a few, he the others would think that's thunder. Like with the Lazarus, they thought it was thunder, but it was Jesus talking to the Father. And we're not privy to everything he said all the time, but there are times when there are certain things recorded. And when you find something recorded that Jesus literally said, take it to heart, study it, study it to the max. Because not only is he teaching people how to pray, he is making an apprentice out of you. He's showing you, and he's walking it out in his life. Luke chapter, remember that, Luke chapter 11, Matthew chapter 6. Teach us to pray. He's teaching them. But in John chapter 17, he prays to his father. They got taught, but then they got hands on. They got to see him praying. Then they got to see a little bit of the father, a few of them, Peter, James, and John, in the Mount of Transfiguration. There's Moses, Elijah, and Jesus. He told them that. He said, some of you won't even see death until you see the Son of Man coming in his glory. Eight days later, which is like when a child is born, eight days later, it's the Brit, the, the brit Milah, the, the circumcision. Eight days later, Jesus, uh, Moses and Elijah appears with him on the Mount of Olives. They wanted to build three tabernacles with him. And then they heard a voice that wasn't the voice of Jesus. It wasn't the Holy Ghost. They literally, now the Holy Ghost was with Jesus, but they literally heard the Father. The father said, this is my beloved son. Listen to him. Remember that cloud came over them and they were afraid? See, God speaks in many ways. And I'm talking about prayer and the presence of God. When we learn, and you who are watching, when we learn how to walk in that, you'll find that your prayer and your communication with the father is not limited to words any more than a deaf mute is limited to words. You'll find that your prayers are more than words. Words are a major part of it. We live by the Word of God. But the Word of God shows up in many ways, too. The Word of God shows up as the gifts of the Spirit, as the fruit of the Spirit, as the nature of God. You don't think shalom, erene, peace is the word of God? When Yeshua, Jesus, is the prince of peace, and he is the word, therefore peace is the word of God. Oh, glory. Well, I'm done. There's so much. I, 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 if I could tell you, let me just give you this conclusion here, this thing. I'm done with the message. If I... And I know the Holy Spirit will help me to do it. If I could convey to you the intent of God and what God has planned for Faith Temple, 
you would spend literally hours in prayer. Even on your job, you would be in and out all day long. When you have a 30 seconds here and there, you'll be talking to God. And God will begin to show you things. And miracles will take place in the spirit realm before they happen in the natural. And even when you walk in the service, the miracles, some of those miracles that are taking place won't be because the man of God or the woman of God is standing up speaking. It will be because of all of your worship and your intercession and your praise and your meditation and your thanksgiving and you seeing visions and dreams and praying accordingly, praying according to them, to your Father in the name of Jesus. And the Holy Spirit is helping you. He's not only the Sunanti Lambonetai, he's the Paracletos, another type of helper. He is also Koinonia, another form of help in communion. And you walk in a service, and people will be healed. And the man's, man of God may think, well, it's because I'm here, they're healed. No, thank God. God has you here. Yeah, so the, he could draw the crowd, but they are healed because of your prayers. Are you hearing me? They're, here, they're healed because of your communion with God. You're talking to God, and God is talking back. And you may be sitting in a service, and God may say to you, get up and go over and lay hands on this person, and you do, and they're instantly healed. Or you may say, I don't want them to know the reason why. I don't want you to get any natural credit. I'm giving you credit. Just go and sit behind them. Don't touch them or anything. You don't even have to pray. Just sit behind them. You sit behind them, and all of a sudden, they jump up, and they think they're healed because the man or woman of God up front. And you know that they were healed because you're of your obedience to the Spirit of God. And you don't say a word about it. You don't jump up and say, yeah, God told me to sit back. Don't do that. Let the man of God rejoice, and everybody's giving accolades to the man of God. And they'll invite the man of God back. Why? Because he's drawing the crowd. Then you get to let him draw, God use him to draw the crowd, then you get to move in on it. And more and more miracles happen. We don't take anything away from anybody. We do it better when we do it together. So, finally, I take more time with you. And I take the liberty of going beyond the schedule. Because I'm supposed to move you out of your comfort zone. You know, when Jesus discipled people, he did not disciple them on the basis of convenience. And he had a lot of disciples, not just the 12. But it was inconveniencing. I'm starting up a discipleship again with men and women, even pastors and mature leaders. But I'm letting them know, as God puts it on their heart to contact me about it, that it's not a convenience. Because I can grab any group from anywhere for convenience. And say, let's meet. When does everybody have time to meet? But I used to train up people and their leaders in churches, head leaders and their missionaries and they're all over the world. And they have, some of them have super large churches and so forth where I'd have the man who had to be to work at six o'clock, I'm sorry, six, or, I'm sorry, uh, eight o'clock in the morning. Uh, and he lived a hundred miles away. Some of them did. And they would have to get out of bed, meet with me for discipleship in Saginaw, Michigan at two o'clock in the morning and go directly from there back to Detroit to their job. Women, I had women's discipleship class, had it at a different time, not at two in the morning with them. I would have it seven or eight in the evening, and they would have to have babysitters. But it was at a time that inconvenienced them. I had couples discipleship, women's discipleship, men's discipleship, and I didn't make it convenient for any of them because the devil cares nothing about your convenience. If you're not trained, the enemy will hit you when it's inconveniencing and when it's your weakness, and he'll take you out. You do not take people through basic training in the military based on convenience. In fact, you expose them to all types, all kinds of inconveniences, so that when they face the enemy, they are prepared. The body of Christ looks for convenience. Give me an hour and a half of church. If you're Lutheran... 55 minutes. If you're Catholic, 45 minutes. If you're Baptist, 55 minutes to an hour. Pentecostal, hour and a half to hour and 45 minutes. Go beyond that, people start complaining. Convenience. Well, that's for Christians. 
but not for disciples that become apostles and leaders and so forth. So I'm a pastor's pastor, a bishop's bishop, a rabbi's rabbi. I'm not just any pastor coming through. And so I'm inconveniencing you as it is appropriate to teach us how to stay longer, to hear more, to listen in our spirit, and to do what others are not doing. If you're willing, and this is very important for you, so that you can be able to do this kind of thing, you know, you have to be willing, to, we have to be willing to take the time to learn and to grow. We've got to get through basic training before we actually start seeing these great victories. And if you are willing, write this down. Write it down. <laughs> write this down. You can, the pastors already know it, you can share it with them later. If you are willing to do what most people will not do, you will be able to do what most people cannot do. Hear me on this. If you are willing to do, consistently that is, what most people will not do, you will then be able to do what most people cannot do, what they can't do. That's why you have different levels of degrees in college. You have more bachelors than you do masters. You have more masters than you do doctorates. And then you have fewer specialists in fellowships. Why? Because each one requires a level of doing that others won't do. Then they're able to do what others can't do. In the body of Christ, how many have really gone through basic training? We got saved and we were children and we grew up, you can grow up into an adult and still not go through basic training. So then we're, quote, I have on the, the armor of God, Ephesians 6. How can you put on that armor and keep it on? Because when you put it on, it's supposed to stay on forever, from the Greek words there. How can you do that? How can you hold it up? When David wasn't prepared, he couldn't handle Saul, uh, uh, Saul's armor. He wasn't prepared for that kind. God has given us his whole, all, all, pan, pas, whole, this those are Greek words, for all, everything, his armor. How are we going to put on his armor to fight when we haven't even gone through the basic training? When we haven't even been inconvenience. We have not even resisted unto blood. Hebrews 12. We know how to shout, dance, jump, praise the Lord, give testimonies, talk about the goodness of God and all of that, but we don't know how to go behind enemy lines and, and rescue the perishing, care for the dying, draw them out and get them back to safety. We don't know how to operate as special forces against the camp of the enemy who has lost his armor. And so when we hear teaching a little longer, when we hear have a service a little longer, it takes us beyond what most people will do to on purpose get us to the point where we can do what most people cannot do. And then we can train others likewise. Jesus took the time not to train everybody, but he had a certain group. He had, he had 72. He had 120. He had, a, in some cases, like 5,000. But out of the, the main 12, and all of them were, were disciples, but 12 were apostles. Then he had some extra apostles, too. But one of those apostles was doing great for a while, but he was the son of perdition. And he lost out. On, he chose to go differently. Satan entered him, and he betrayed Jesus. But out of the 12, he had the 12 that he would take aside. Then there were times when you see up to six of them with him. Then you see three, Peter, James, and John. 
then you would see just John, just one. He had a unique, special assignment and equipping. In addition from equipping them all, he had special assignments and special ways of training the 72, the 12, the 6, the 3. But sometimes you would say even the 4, Peter, James, Peter and Andrew, James and John, and then just John, the one who loved him, the one whom he loved, it says. That meant there were special operations and special attention and special time he put into John that he didn't put into, in addition to what he put into the, all the others. How else can you get thrown historically into oil and it boils you and yet not burn you? And it takes you back to when you walk through the, when you go through the waters, it will not overtake you, neither shall the flame, uh, neither, you, when you walk through the waters, you will not drown, neither will, the flood will not overtake you, you'll go through the fire, you will not be burned, neither shall the flames kindle upon you. So let's get to that part. There's going to be a time, hear me, when I'm here with us, when this place will be full because of the power of God, the miraculous of God, to come in and just have the crowd come, that kind of thing can happen here and there. But when the crowd is coming, not because of me, but because of you, the people are saying, this is what's happening in their church and in their ministry. Yeah, they have a man of God who comes in, but oh, I've seen God work through her. I, something that's going on with her, you know, at work, I just, I don't know what it is, but, it's, but I, I'm curious. I want, to, I want to know. People will come, and your testimonies will grow. They'll say, oh, when people are around those people that get healed, they get healed. You know of so many people who were not in the fivefold ministries, mother so-and-so, sister so-and-so. If you called her over to pray, you got results. You know, that kind of, and so the power of God is going to move like that, but he's getting us beyond. We have to go beyond Brother Hart, Pastor Hart. We have to go beyond Brother Eptigrove. We've got to come on up to the levels that God is desiring for us. But before we go up, we have to go deep. I've got to get our roots down there. And I haven't been able to have any of the types of meetings like I love to have because I'm the one who's supposed to get your roots down there. Are you hearing me? So that when you're up here and you're doing all this stuff and the adversary, the winds and the waves and the adversary and every type of way comes against you, you're on the rock and you will outlast it all. Because from the beginning to the end, it's happening in you from a standpoint of victory. Victory. Hallelujah. Let's pray. Father, I ask you to send the Lord to you. Send the Lord to you. Would you lift your hands to the Lord right now? Hallelujah. And welcome the training of the Lord. And then welcome the miraculous of God. Just say to God in your own word, God, whatever type of power, all the different types that's in the, in the Bible, in your word, that you want to flow on me, put on me and flow through me, God, I'm open. Just let your power... Your power, whatever type it is, flow through me, God. If it's resurrection power, let it flow. Whatever type of healing power it is, God, let it flow. If it's to drive out demons and devils, God, let the power flow through me. God, whatever, if it's to, to, to bring mobility to the, paralysis, to, to the paralyzed, God, just let your power flow. God, whatever type of power that's in your word that you want to move up through me, that you want to place upon me and work through me, God, I'm open to you. Just do that, Lord. And God, whatever gifts you want to move, you want to place within me, place upon me and move through me, God, just let the gifts flow. I want them to flow. I want them to flow, God. Just let them flow. And God, whatever level of training and spiritual discipline in your word by the Holy Ghost that you want to do in me, God, I'm asking God for the helper, the Holy Ghost, to be with me. I'm willing to go to the level of training and depth to withstand any and everything the enemy has stolen and to go behind enemy lines boldly and take back anything and everything that he's stolen from the ones you give me the assignment to go after. God, I'm opening myself to you. 
And I'm at a most If you know how to pray in, the, in, in tongues, begin to pray in the spirit right now. Because there's some level of this that is just deeper in the spirit realm. And if you don't know even how to pray and what to pray for as you ought, right now just trust the Holy Ghost to make to make intercession for you, to come alongside you, with you, with groanings that can't be uttered in the spirit realm. And, and God is preparing, and God is getting us ready because there's going to be a greater move than wheelchairs emptying and crutches being released from people. Greater miracles. So when a pandemic or something hits, this will be the first place in the region, the first place the first place that people are coming to, and nobody will even be here at some times in those situations. They'll just come and hang out at the doors and on the property because they're saying, just like they would with Jesus, if I can touch the hem of his garment, if I can just get near the place, if I can just get my hands on the building, like they would, the, they wanted to with the Ark of the Covenant, but they couldn't. There was a certain way you had to touch that and only certain people, but people would say, if I can just get near the anointing, the miracle will happen for me. That's what I'm talking about. That even the building will not be treated as normal. That when people walk by the building, just like they would walk by Israel and they would see Solomon's temple and then Herod's temple and they knew that was a special place. That when they walk by the building, the anointing will be strong. Whew. You don't think it could happen? When, they, when Elisha's bones were touched... It raised a man from the dead. There have been many testimonies of those who've gone to Catherine Kuhlman's grave, to her tomb, to the shrine there, to her tomb. And the power and the anointing that emanates from that place. She's dead in the natural, but the Holy Ghost that was in her is still speaking. The power is still emanating. If they could anoint handkerchiefs and people could get healed from them. If they didn't have to touch Peter or what have you. If they could just step in his shadow in the book of Acts and they would be healed. Just in the shadow. You'd think it's strange if they came out in front of a building and the power of God was so strong because of all of your prayers, intercession, and your connection with God that they would just, if I can just get on the property. See, that's what Jairus said. Jesus if you just get to my property, just come to my house. He didn't say, he just said, if you get to my house, Jesus. That's the first thing. Jesus, I haven't gotten to your house yet, Jairus. Don't say anything. Don't fear. Believe. I stopped to take care of this blood issue with this woman that nobody else could help her with. I haven't gotten there yet. And she didn't touch me directly. She touched the prayer shawl, the end of the prayer shawl. And the power of healing went out of me. And hit her. I didn't even know it, who it was. It just left me. Something left me. How about that happening with you? You're walking along and all of a sudden something leaves you. There are two people I remember. Certain times one was in his 30s at the time, Charles Lang. And the other one is at a, a doctor at a Bishop Keith Connors Church in Leavenworth, Texas. He was like a, an 11-year-old kid uh, there. Uh, his name, they would tell me his name if they were watching. The spirit leaped in me like it did with Mary, when, uh, like it did with Elizabeth, that John leaped, and her and Mary was filled with the Spirit. When Jesus, when Mary approached, and Jesus, she was impregnated with Jesus. Twice, and I turned to Charles Lang, who was a CPA, and he was of a, the, the comptroller of a large company. I said, we were coming together for the first time at a board meeting to start a radio station. I said, did you feel that? He said, yeah. Not something we could explain. We had never met before. But all of a sudden, we were closer than twins, identical twins. Had never met. It was in the spirit realm. Then secondly was this, this little boy. And God told me, he said, start giving to the ministry here to set aside a fund for him. And when he's 25 years old, he can withdraw that. Perhaps even pay off his education or what have you. I flew in from out of the country to Chicago over to Connors Church for a meeting and then flew right back out. And then from there, I flew over to the funeral for Janice. Cut my meeting short. 
to go over to Janice's funeral, O'Brien. And when and we were there, none of us talked to one another, but we all showed up. You, Dr. Music, we were all there. Brother Clark is his mother-in-law, so he would have been there. But we showed up. They didn't contact us. I mean, they didn't contact me. I heard about it. We didn't talk to each other. And yet, we were one in spirit. We showed up. And it's made such a difference in Brother Joe. He still talks about that, how that impact his and his whole family. There is one kid there. He was probably about 25. He was there with Janice's granddaughter. That was his girlfriend or something. He was sitting in the back, this musician and all this stuff. And I walked up. I started singing before I spoke it. And she was, her casket was there. And when I got done, I sang again. I sat down. This boy was just undone. He wasn't saved. We went to lunch, all of us. He's there, and I, somebody told me his name because of Janet's granddaughters there, and they were getting to eat, and he was so sheepish, staying behind everybody. When I, it, it, because when I walked out of the, 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 the uh, mausoleum, he was standing by his car hoping I'd pay attention to him, and I said, you look like you're right out of a movie, the way his car was and the way everything was sitting, and Janet's granddaughter just walked away because they had planned it for him to be there, and hopefully that it would get my attention and I would talk to him. I gave him a, just a... a 10 seconds of attention, went to the car and got in. Now he's at the lunch and he's holding back and he's just, and I said, called him by name and said, come on, get in line with your girlfriend and, and get some lunch. That's just the fact that I, ca I, I called his name. It just was just overwhelming to him. Then when we're leaving and Junior was walking me out to the car, this guy and his girlfriend went to their car and waited. I was hoping that I would come down that way. Not knowing, well, he saw my car apparently, so he parked down there. He was hoping, and I walked down, and I'm there with Junior, and he's in the car just waiting to pull out, but he won't leave. And I just knocked on his window. I said, Hey, called him out, and he said, Get out and give me a hug. He jumped out of the car, and Junior said, I, said, I told him, I said, I don't know this guy, but you know, God is doing something with him from the, the funeral. I gave him a great big hug. I won't continue the story after this, but I gave him a great big hug. His girlfriend and, and one of Janice's other granddaughters in the car, and, and uh, they're watching like they're hoping, they were just hoping something like this would happen to him. And when I let him go, hug, he jumped up in the air and just said, I've got to see you again. <laughs> jumped in the car, and then they backed off and left. Junior and I were standing there and said, it's amazing what the power of the Holy Spirit will do, isn't it? What God will do just by sitting next to somebody, what the Holy Ghost will do. Well, I've had five closings. I think you're going to take an offering, aren't you? What? Oh, that's what you did? Okay. I was going to apologize for, well, not really apologize, but to say I should have given the time earlier for that. So that was already done. Would you all stand? Praise God. Pastor, would you come up? Glory to God. Your strength is coming back. Whoa. <laughs> Clarity. Thank you for tuning in to our stream. However, this brings a conclusion to our service. We would like to invite everyone to help us out by making any donations as you please, as they do help us to continue our ministry. If you would like to send a gift online, donations can be made using the donate button at our website, faithtemplebg.org, or if you would prefer to send something in the mail, all checks or money orders can be written to Faith Temple and can be mailed to the address 175 State Street in Bowling Green, Ohio, zip code 43402. We really do appreciate any and all gifts sent in. We thank you for tuning in to our stream, and we hope to catch you on the next one. We love you, and God bless.